All righty. Okay. Record. Okay, you guys, we are officially recording. I am Professor Jennifer Harrison Howard, and this is Exam One Review. It's a beautiful 6 p.m. here in Tucson, Arizona, um, 9 p.m. in other parts of the world and other time zones. Um, if you guys can, some, if you're not able to, because um, we share all of this information with your professors. Yeah, there you go. You're typing your name in so that it shows up and it just looks really good when you attend one of these. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. I will share my screen. I have a PowerPoint to share with you guys. This by all means is not all inclusive, um, but I think it's a pretty good review. All righty, you guys, exam one will take place as most of you already know during whenever your scheduled classes next week. Um, your professors will be in touch. You have the entire class period. That is your class is the exam. Whether you finish in 35 minutes or take the entire class, I've known people to get A's both sides. Don't rush through it, but that is your class. And we, um, the last class, um, we usually have grades posted by, um, by Sunday. I teach a Friday class as well. And so, you know, after everybody's taking their class, so I'll have students email me, what's my grade? I'm like, we are still working on it. All right, so let's get let's get started. It is interactive, you guys. I know it's late on your end, but um, stay with me. Okay, so before you even um, go out to, let's say you're working with a, uh, a, a group of uh, a homeless shelter, um, for, let's say a homeless camp at a certain part of town, you define this, this is your community, this is your population that you're going to work with. Leslie, what is, what is one thing you're going to do before you even go out there and start anything? What are you going to do beforehand? Um, I want to make sure, like, um, I guess, like, analyze where I'm going. Am I going to be safe? What am I going to bring? Tell right. everyone where I'm going, keep my phone charged. Right, right, right. And then what type of research are you going to do beforehand, Sophia? What are you, what are you wanting to know? Um, I guess I would say the demographic that you're going to be working with. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, the type of probably health problems that do they have? Yes, 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 yes. Before you guys, just like when you, when you go to clinicals and you, um, you know, you're going to be working with Ms. Smith in room 110. You're going to review her chart. You're going to review this, review that, looking, um, do as much research as possible on what, what's ailing her. Look at her med list. Look at contra. You're going to do all of that. You guys already know that. So population health is the health status of a defined population. So I'm going to use the example of a, a homeless camp on first and 10th. I don't know. Um, so you have your defined, that's your population that you're going to be working with including the distribution of health. So you want to, before you even go out there, you want to know as much about the folks that you're going to work with as possible. And safety first, safety, safety, safety first. But you also want to look at too, like as much as you can, part of that is like, okay, you know their status, what's their knowledge? Do, are they aware of, um, you know, that there's been, you know, COVID outbreaks? What, looking at prevention, looking at playgrounds, if it's applicable. You want to just do your um, do your assessment on your community first before you even go out the door. And so um, talking about patients' rights, patients, unless they're, de they're declared incompetent, the patients should be able to, they have self-determination. They can, um, we may think we know what's best for them. You know, we have all of this healthcare knowledge and all of this or what have you. But at the end of the day, it's their decision and their choice in their life. I've known folks that were 
on dialysis for years. I'm like, you know what? I'm done. I'm just like done with this. And so we have to be respectful. We want to be their advocates all the way, all the way with this. Because at the end of the day, it's their choice. Um, so keep that in mind. The primary focus of community-based nursing is care of care of ill patients and families, but also we're managing chronic diseases. We're focusing on primary, secondary, tertiary prevention that we'll get into a little bit further. And then um, the whole point is, is that when you, you have your defined population and you're going out there, however you find, find them, you want to leave them whenever it's said and done, however long you spend, your, spend their weeks, months, years, leave them better than how you found them. And that honestly should be your like focus when you're, when you're in clinic or what have you. If somebody comes in in a 10, by the end of your shift, if they're not any better, we, we need to, we need to um, figure out, we need to figure out why. And so we work with individuals, families, communities, okay? So if you have your community, yes, you're, you're working with individuals in that community and your focus is on the greater good. So if you have a homeless camp and you're working with, that's your population, yeah, you may work with individual folks in that, but you're, you're let's say you're giving flu shots out to everybody out there so that you don't, that influenza doesn't spread through the camps and what have you, teaching about hygiene and the like. One of my favorite, favorite, favorite slides, if, and, and I like to talk to, you know, when I talk to my class and lecture, when you when you go through your weeks, if you earlier on get a solid understanding of primary, secondary, tertiary, I can almost guarantee you, because I don't like to do guarantees, you'll do very well in this class because that's what, that's what pop, I was a public health nurse. Um, I work on a, I still work on a reservation. I've been out there 15 years. I started out as a public health nurse and I, I was assigned to districts. You know, just think of like Mocking Jay and what have you. And inside those districts were villages, remote villages. And um, and so that that was my focus was, okay, how can I make sure? Because we've had Rocky Mountain spotted fever. We've had dengue. We've had um, syphilis outbreaks. We've had pertussis, whooping cough. We've had some things. And so... We want to, in a perfect world, have no one with any chronic diseases, um, anything afflicting them. And so we, you want to live in the land of primary as, as much as possible. They're all important, and we're going to go through the slide, but that's, that's, your, that's where you want, that's where you want to, to, to stay at the, at the bottom of the pyramid. Because if you notice the colors are green, you know, like the stop sign green and yellow and red, that's what it's trying to tell you there. So let's get into um, primary. And again, when you think of primary, if you, I, I like to memorize or just little simple things, primary prevent. So Badala, you were in my class earlier. I could not see your beautiful face, but I see your name. Okay. Would, would you like to share uh, an example of a primary prevention effort that we talked about or that you want to share with everyone? Yes, we talked about immunization. Yes, yes. That's a very good, you know, if you think primary prevent immunization, you'll be, you'll be good there. So again, prevention, primary. There is not an exist a disease that exists anywhere, and we want to keep it that way. That's primary. And so, also think of um, thing when you think of primary prevention, it, it includes a big piece is health education, um, health promotion, um, uh, education. And so I've had students that say, well, Professor Harrison Howard, um, 
you know, there was something about diabetes and, you know, there was education and why well, wasn't that correct? Because a disease exists. As nurses, you should never stop educating your patients. Like I mentioned earlier in my class, if you're a chemo nurse and that's your, you know, that's your world and that and you don't educate that patient that they may lose their hair and they're going to wake up, may wake up one day with a big old bald spot and you didn't educate them. Education never stops, but a disease exists. So you don't want to get tripped up on that. Primary, nothing exists. I mean, think about it. Have you ever thought, why are they giving me a flu shot? I don't have a flu. So that's what they're trying to do. So then remember that no disease exists. You're trying to prevent, primary prevent. All right, I beat that horse down. Secondary, think of screenings. Think of your mammograms. Think of your colorectal cancer screenings. Think of screenings you're looking, you're detecting. Um, also think of um, surveillance too. When you're doing like that, CDC is wonderful at doing that. And, and any of your health departments, when they notice cases are going up, um, so they're monitoring health status. But screening, secondary screening is good to keep in mind. Um, but again, no disease exists when you begin your screening. If you're looking, a mammogram, I'll just use that example. If they find a lump or if a woman palpates a lump, it doesn't mean she has cancer. She could have a cyst. I mean, she could have cancer. I hope not. But they won't know until they actually do biopsies and, and, and get a piece of that, that tissue, which is not what we're here to talk about today. But again, you want to keep it extremely simple and realize that secondary is screening. The only, only prevention that has to deal with any type of disease that you need to know is tertiary, which is that red square at the top. And so someone has diabetes, someone has asthma, someone has hypertension, um, et cetera, okay? And so if you get to tertiary treat, they're trying to give you guys little, little clues here, then a disease exists, but you're always going to educate someone. You're going to educate someone about insulin, when to take their carbs and well, all of that stuff. So if a disease exists, it exists, um, that's tertiary. And so when I think of, everybody likes to use the example of diabetes, you know, you have new diagnosis, it's the whole thing, they got to get fit be checked, all the kind of stuff. But the point is, you're trying to, you, everything is prevention. You don't want them to lose kidneys and, and toes and amputees and what have you. Um, but you're never going to come back down to primary because they always have that disease. I have patients that manage their diabetes quite nicely. They've lost a few pounds. They don't need insulin no more. They don't need metformin anymore, but their diet control diabetes. What breaks my heart when I hear, I got a little bit of sugar. No, you got diabetes. You got it. I'm glad you're controlling it, but you still, you still have it. So, yeah. So keep that in mind, you guys. All right. My screen wants to be stuck. All right. Here we go. All right. So Medicaid versus Medicare. So when I... I think of Medicaid, for me personally, I think of Band-Aid. And I, when I think of Medicare, I think of caring for elderly people. You don't have to remember it that way. But Medicare is care for individuals 65 or older. And it's these lovely baby boomer, boomers that were born in like 60s and what have you, like after Vietnam, I don't get into all of that. Um, they're getting older. And so um, they're using Medicare and using a lot of it. Um, the impact on the federal government's insurance program for people 65 or older um, is increasing. Medicare is expected to be enormous. Um, the spending for that is projected to be growing faster and faster and faster because of the baby boomers. They can't help it. I'm happy that they're getting older. But it's tapping out the Medicare funds. Um, and I personally would like for it to be there when I get older. <laughs> but anyway, 
And Medicaid helps those with low income and classified as unable to work with or disabled. So in the United States, we have two systems uh, for healthcare systems. You have your private, think of Blue Cross Blue Shield, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and then you think of public, what we just talked about, which is the Medicare and the Medicaid. Um, issues with uh, the healthcare system that we're all aware of and should be aware of is access to healthcare, those that have and the have nots. And then um, private and public uh, uh, people with insurance or those who can personally pay are often viewed as uh, receiving superior care. That's that's how it's viewed. That's um, how many times that we call the doctor's office. And this is nothing against insurance. I'm just being real where they're like, what kind of insurance you got? What's your number? Um, so, so that's that. And in, in a country that we have the most, no, highest number of billionaires, it's just, I promise you, I'm not going to get on that soapbox. All right. The working poor, those who do not qualify for public funds, either because they make too much money um, to qualify, those folks that are in the middle are especially vulnerable. Hence, we have the Affordable Care Act. Um, the, when the Affordable Care Act passed, more folks were able to have health care. And that's just a wonderful thing because that's how the system functions in some form because I can't write a check for all of my healthcare needs. Um, and certainly probably not the, the person at the homeless camp. So healthcare and all of us issues is a huge, huge public health, again, public health um, concern that you should be aware of. And so um, it has to help more Americans have access increase Americans who can afford it, and then increase quality and lower costs. So um, keep in mind that one change with the American Care, uh, Affordable Care Act is that more, be, more folks were able to purchase it. And so it's became, it became more affordable, hence the name. Um, affordable care is uh, access has lower costs. So that's something to keep in mind is lower cost access um, lower costs associated too many A's to, uh, with the Affordable Care Act, which is, a, which is great. Um, um, if anyone has been overseas or lived in other countries um, in comparison to, um, again, we have the largest number of billionaires. It's just our, our uh, maternity uh, mortality rates, uh, infant mortality rates, for a country as rich as we are is just not, and this is not a personal thing, it's, it's part of the song, it's just unacceptable. Okay, so Family Medical Leave Act started in 1993. I actually remember when this act came about, um, I really do, because it gave us the, gave everyone, employer, employees, uh, flexibility with, uh, taking off leave for family issues, um, being a caregiver, um, without having to worry about losing your job because the federal government with this particular act said, nope, 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 we're gonna allow them to take off if they want 12 weeks after they have a baby or uh, they adopt a kid and that sort of thing. So it's wonderful. Um, it's a wonderful act that came about. And a lot of my patients, like I said, in clinic, you know, if they have chronic issues, if they have, um, they get a lot of migraines. I'll give that as a good example. And they have to call out a lot and they bring in the FMLA paperwork. And if it's signed by a healthcare provider, a doctor, NP, the end, and they, they invoke their FMLA, they cannot lose their job. So, and then American Disability Act, you guys just be aware of that is pretty self-explanatory, was passed in 1990. 
Uh, the quality and safety education for nurses is not a, it's not federally mandated. I guess what that means is it's a private entity. But what I like about QSEN, you know, to keep in mind, it's actually a pretty awesome place to find information. Um, this is, it helps nurses improve what we do. And there's a lot of different organizations and companies out there but they want you to know about this particular one. So QSEN, quality and safety education for nurses, just like it says, making sure our quality is on point, making sure that we're safe. We talked about evidence-based practice in my class. It's a great place to find information, hint, hint. Patient safe, patient center care, safety. This is a lovely organization, just another of the many organizations that are out there to help us do the best we can with our patients, providing evidence. So, all righty. Speaking of evidence-based practice, a lovely, another lovely one of my pyramids. Um, where to start? Anything um, that you do provide in nursing should be backed by evidence. When you're doing reviews, if you're looking up information on a medication, um, there are reputable sites to go to to find information on medication that's ev evidence-based. We used to carry a, a, a book with us. I think everything is online or what have you, but you, you want to go, you want to have reputable sites that that are, have been researched and scientific and proven, and they're not difficult to find. Um, so you wanna use best practices in making decisions because you're taking care of somebody's mom, somebody's auntie, that sort of thing. Um, so keep that in mind. And um, when you're looking at evidence, this slide here has it ranked in when you're doing your research, you want to you want to pull from the top of the pyramid opposed to the bottom. So when you're looking at sy systematic reviews, that is just like if you can get a hold of a good systematic review where somebody has basically done all the work for you, that's just like golden. Um, so systematic reviews are like when people um, Researchers, they, they summarize research, several research articles about a given topic. So let's just say somewhere down the line, they're, they're, they start putting out systematic reviews about COVID. So let's say they come from researchers have done stuff at CDC and the World Health Organization and all these articles. Well, someone or groups analyzes these articles and put them together in a, in a review process so you have all of this summary nicely put together so that you don't have to go around like they've done the work for you so it's evidence-based it's peer review it's all of that stuff the research has already been done the results are already out and so when you're doing your research on a given topic let's just say systemic lupus and you're looking at all of these different, um, you can find folks that have already done systematic reviews on that topic. So that's that's why it's a small part of the pyramid because it's a lot of work, but somebody has to go back and review that. So that's your gold standard. Your randomized control um, studies is just that when you have um, people are assigned randomly, not even the researcher knows, they got letter X, Y, and Z, double blinded and all that stuff. And it goes on to there when you have cohort studies, case control studies, um, your gold standards are the top. You don't want antidotal. It's like, mm, it's almost like, um, like, a, like a verbal report almost. It's not research. If you're saying it's not evidence-based, and you're probably like, well, why is it on there? Because it does exist. It's, it's an option. Um, I don't think I've ever even used an anecdotal expert opinion. 
um, these are like personal stories. And there's nothing wrong with, um, let me see if I can give you an example. Like somebody, um, I don't know, giving a personal story about their time in um, concentration camp or something, their experiences. There's nothing wrong with their experience, but you have to keep it like um, scientific. So as far as scientific evidence base is far down there. And so when people are looking at your research and they're, they're seeing where, what you're using, just like when you guys did your healthy people and all of that, first I'm like, where are they getting their information from? And you know that because you, you're telling me that I should believe what you write down based on wiki. I'm just saying you wouldn't, but you know, uh, but if you got CDC, I'm like, okay, all right, okay, good, all right. So I already trust CDC, even though I may not know you, but I know CDC and I know World Health Organization. So you want your stuff to be reputable. Um, so make sure you know that. And then health disparities and vulnerable populations. This slide looks busy, but it is so very important. Oh, and let me digress. If I did not mention, because um, folks will always ask me, I cannot personally share my slides with you. You can feel free to write, re oh, review this over and over to the cows come home. So please don't ask me. You can ask, but I can't. All right, so um, health disparities, um, the largest impact is economic. So that means it's related to um, uh, finances, uh, access to healthcare, paying for different things. They usually have folks with health disparities, um, higher chronic disease is often seen in groups, less follow-up. Again, I the typical picture for me is the person that's at, nothing against folks in the homeless camps, but you got, they're exposed to the elements, they're out there, they probably have different conditions that's affecting them. Um, and so the seven food factors are listed here for you as far as what impacts uh, health disparities, income and social status, education, low education is linked, safe water, clean water, do they have a place to shower? Are they employed? How are the roads, physically, the community? Social support, do you have friends, family, community, someone, um, belief systems, genetics, health services, gender, all of these seven topics are good to know um, factors that can impact or negatively impact someone's uh, uh, and place them at being at risk for um, different ailments. And, uh, and so where do I wanna go with this? So as a public health nurse, these are different targets, some things that you can change in the system with as well. So for example, um, the physical environment, getting them access to clean water and that sort of thing. Another word that you may hear interchangeably with um, health disparity and vulnerable populations, social determinants of health. And I just have some information here. So social determinants of health are the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, um, and age that shape their health. So let me give you an example. Let's just say somebody was born in a worn, torn area of some part of the world. So they were born and, the, and their environment, there was a war going on. That's where they were born. That's where they grew up. That's where they live. That's where they work. Um, and let's just say that um, somehow they get out of it and they come over to the United States at 70 something with probably one or two, several issues, not including like, um, I'm not saying mental health concerns, but all of the, the negative impacts of not being able to have clean water, access to care, medications and that sort of thing. So your nursing interventions, you know, there's always interventions with me, Interventions with something you can do are designed to help vulnerable populations gain access to what they need, okay? Again, you can think of the person in the homeless camp. You can think of a child that's homeless. You can think of um, a pregnant teen, somebody with asthma. I can keep going. 
And so this picture alone should, rep, should speak volume to what we're gonna talk about. So then vulnerable populations, know your definition of vulnerable population. If you should see this again anywhere, you should be able to pick out what makes this person vulnerable. So it's a group. Vulnerable population is a subgroup. So then you have a group, and then you have two subgroups. Um, so let's just say um, southwest part of town is this group. And then they have a huge tenement camp uh, or homeless camp. That's the subgroup of this population in this part of town. It's more likely to develop health problems as a result of exposure to risk. What are those risks? Glad you asked. A, B, C, and D. All right. There's environmental, and they give examples of lead paint, but environmental could be the fact that you know they are um, in an area that's next to a landmine. I don't know. Social hazards. There's a typo there. Crime, violence personal behavior, diet, like of adequate diet, and nutrition, especially for children, you know, as they're growing, exercise, you know, that's all important for your body. Biological and genetic makeup, are there any compromised conditions and what have you? And this, it may seem like a lot, like I can't do this all by myself, but as a public health nurse of many years on an indigenous, um, in the reservation, you're never alone. You're not doing all of this by yourself. Uh, it's a team approach. And um, I'll just say that. So then let's, let me move this image out of the way. By now, this is a busy slide, but by now we should have an idea of, okay, so that's wonderful. What what is it that we, we do? And we mentioned this throughout the entire presentation, but you want to know the primary goal is completely different than your bedside nursing because prevention, 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 prevention. There's different things in different levels, but that is your ultimate goal, period. That's why you go out and you do these mass vaccination drives but you, because you're trying to prevent something that has never even occurred. And so these are the things that are listed here. You want to, again, focus on the prevention of disease and disability. So when I say prevention of disease, think of giving the flu shot and then think of prevention of disability. Go, go to that tertiary and think of somebody has diabetes that's uncontrolled and you're trying to prevent them from getting foot ulcers and all that kind of stuff and all of that and not lose their leg. Um, we're population focused. So then again, if you're the school nurse, that is your population. Um, and then there's different, there's always policies that are in place, but you, you wanna be familiar with policies for the department where you work and so that you work within those set guidelines. Um, but just getting a little bit about policies, anything to try to help, again, reduce mortality, death related to communicable diseases. Um, so people will write policies based on that. Like, okay, so this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna write a policy for school health that children blah, 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 and get this done, what have you. All right, but the policies are focused on public health so that we can um, decrease illness and, and complication. So the leading cause of mortality has shifted from um, shifted to chronic disease. I mentioned it in my class earlier that you know back in the 1900s or whatever, folks didn't make it to 50. 50 was probably an elder um, that died of the Spanish flu and yellow fever and uh, malaria and all this stuff. I can't remember the last time I heard somebody that died of malaria. Um, I'm sure it has happened in other places in the world, but you don't hear about that anymore. Um, but anyway, so um, now it's chronic. So you're looking at chronic conditions, asthma, hypertension. I had a patient, a young patient of mine died a couple of weeks ago of um, 
of asthma-related exacerbation, young girl. So um, heart disease and cancer, anyway. So the increase in the number of older adults, uh, an increase in population, you're gonna see more of those baby boomers, and, and I hope not, but chronic conditions because age and things may occur. Um, the population of the world is increasing due to increased fertility rates and then decrease in mortality rates. There's gonna be a lot of people on this globe. Um, and so what, as far as health disparities is concerned, you wanna be aware of what the health disparities are for your population. You wanna be aware of a lot of things so you can help reduce those. Um, can I ask a question about the last slide? <laughs> oh yeah, you guys can ask any questions you want because I will just keep going. Talk to uh, me. Can you explain the first sub bullet? Who? Go back. The one about independence and autonomy. Oh, I think that was like way back there. But hold right on. To that. The second bullet. The second slide. We could ask the hold your questions at the end because unless I can, is it one of these? No, the one we were just talking. This one? Yeah, one more. Yeah, that one. Oh, it's okay. Promotes independence with a nurse and autonomy. Uh, okay, so the primary goal of public health, the prevention and disease and disability, okay, achieved by ensuring that conditions, okay, 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 promotes independence with the nurse and promotes independence. Okay, so as hmm, promoting independence, I can do your stuff for you, but I want you to take care of yourself because I'm not gonna be around forever. I mean, I'm only assigned to take care of you for six weeks. And then I need you to learn how to take care of yourself. That's how, this is how I learn how to explain stuff. I don't need you to be dependent on me. I need you to be able to take care of your own chronic conditions. That's why you don't wanna get there. Because if you do a health promotion and a vaccine and all of that fun stuff, and it's perfect utopia, I don't have to worry about managing your diabetes because I'm making sure you get your healthy weight and what have you, but I need, you know, faith without works. I need you to do something yourself. I need you to be independent. I need you to care about your health enough to put that donut down. And I can't be around Leslie forever to help you put that donut down. And your sugars were already high. And I need to talk to your granddaughter about telling her not to get you Krispy Kreme. I really do. So yeah, get some wheat toast and put some jelly on it. Does that help? I don't know. All righty, healthy people 2030. So if they specifically have information about healthy people 2030 on your study guide, especially if they talk about school health, I would think that's important. But this particular pot slide, so healthy people, all that is, is a whole bunch of information. I know this, but you only need to worry about it if it relates to whatever you're talking about and it's covered. Does that make sense? This healthy people goes, it's for everything. It's, it's, it's this public health priority for the United States that started way back when that I'm going to help, it's help focus on individuals, the school stuff, there's community stuff, there's environmental rip health stuff, the stuff, the stuff. You know, one of my students like, there's so much. I'm like, no, we're not trying to get you to memorize the whole doggone page. I'm just telling you that what's the purpose of it? So there, every decade, you know, I guess they were like, okay, now we need to focus on this. What's important for you to know is that for 2030, it changed, which means it wasn't there in 2020, to increase it changed to, to discuss health equity and social determinants of health. That's something that's different, that's important to know. So there's set standards, national goals and objectives to measure um, evidence-based goals. And so 
healthy lives that are free of disease, disability, and injury, okay? Lower or get away from health disparities. We don't want health disparity. We want everybody to have access for whatever they need. That's the perfect world. So it changed because it talked about health equity now and social determinants of health. That's completely different. Um, th there's healthy behaviors on there. And, and again, all of this is wonderful, but the individual has to do it themselves. You can make the most perfect program out there ever, but there has to be some action on that person's part. Um, all right. So family, family has changed from what we may think is traditional. Um, and just know that when you're going into families, it could be same sex, different um, different race households, or it can, however, it, however they define as their family, grandmother taking care of her grandchildren, what have you, that's, that's the family. So understand that the family structure has changed over time and there's no right definition. What Budala may think is family and what I may think of family or Leslie may think of family may be completely different. But I'm not wrong. I'm not, he's not wrong. No one's wrong. You know, I mentioned in class today, you know, if 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 Dorothy and, and her dog Toda, if that's their family, that's that's their family. Who am I to not say? I've known friends of mine that to get their um the dogs had cancer and they got chemo. Not that that's their family, but we're not gonna have animals on the test. So your family is that, and you want to involve everyone um that's included in the family if that individual wants to be a part of it. So healthy versus unhealthy, functional versus dysfunctional. How are those nursing priority in individuals? So you would think delegation and priority, uh, prioritization. So they're letting you know that you, you're gonna come across what may be deemed as healthy versus unhealthy, may need a little bit work to be done on one family more so than the other. Some might be functional and dysfunctional, how they communicate with each other, but how do you prioritize your, your interventions? You, you have to prioritize safety first, okay? Always, always, always safety first, all right? You're doing your assessment, you're gathering information, okay? And you're working with that family unit. I don't think you guys have to worry about, um, I don't wanna say, just know that think delegation and prioritization. Let me just say that. And give you too much. All right. So, family crisis may occur, and this is when the family again. You're not thinking of one person. You're thinking of the family because you could have several people having a, a crisis in that family. But anyway, it's one unit. Okay. So, uh, uh, a crisis one individual can cause the whole family to to be unstable. So when the family is not able to cope with an event. They become disorganized, dysfunctional, and that's gonna affect their health if they're not, again, you know, something's going on with mom or dad. And so that crisis is that, how is that kid getting to school? Are they having food and cooking for them? Who's washing their clothes? Are they taking their medicines? I can't do this anymore. So just, just know you may come across that. I'm sure you you may come across it in the hospital, but that's just one person. And then, you know, you get to charge nurse, you do what have you, you call the doctor, but this is crisis in the, in the community. So know that can occur. And then um, let's see here. I put this picture up of an actual genome. I'm not genome, Ecomap. Let me talk about the genome. So a genome is, um, where they map, they can map out someone's genetic information. If, let's just say someone has a, a strong family history of breast cancer and they're able to map out the BRCA gene and that sort of thing. Helpful information for the clients to understand their health risks. So again, you're always providing information, but again, the decision on what to do and how to do is, is always up to them. So your eco map, just get to my notes here. So your eco map is this is actually someone's Alice's eco map. All right. 
And so these are the people that are intimately involved in the things in her life. And then also these are different, um, different pieces of her life that affects, can affect her, um, her health. Uh, you see strong links, you're never, I don't think they're gonna have you design anything like this, but I just wanted to show you what a legit a eco map looks at. So this is like a visual representation if you were to do this with someone to just kind of show them how the flow of their positive and negative, because see, you see the stressful parts, high school, senior, repeating year. So that's her kid. But of course, anything that, any, if anybody with kids knows what affects them, affects you as a parent, it trickles down or what have you. Um, and so those are things that are stressing her out there. And so we need to work with Mary because it's affecting Alice and everybody in that household. And, and um, so, yeah. It's a good little visual piece there to uh, provide information about relationships and what have you. So you can see why maybe Alice is not making it to her appointment. I don't know. It's a good little representation. I like it. And I put this little picture in here because this is, um, if this picture doesn't help you understand what a home visit is, this is actually taken from um, African American Archives. She's a, she's a public health nurse. I want to say back in the 40s. What I love about this particular picture, like you don't have to show me whose moms or what have you, but look at that mom's face. If she did not appreciate that woman, she would not be in that house. Especially probably back in the era, wherever they were. Um, and so she's giving baby a bath. She's probably demonstrating. Um, how to safely do that, water temperature, just the right amount of soap, how to care for, how to do this, that, and the other. So that's actually a home visit. And look at, she's smiling for the cameras. That has, I mean, that's black and white. She is showing all 32. Look how happy she is. She's so happy that lady's coming out to visit her. She don't know what to do. Um, so I loved home visits. I love going out to someone's home and just, you can just get so much, you just sit down, you don't talk, you let people just do like me. And you just look, you know, you gotta, you have to have a face, like, like if you see something out of place, let's say trip rugs or cords at electrical outlet, you don't be like, you gotta develop a face like this. But you gotta take mental note. Um, it's the best way to get your assessment. You go out to where somebody lives. I don't care. You can try to hide what you want, but I will see things. <laughs> and it's, 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 that's what you, that's, that's better than going to them in the hospital bed. I'm going to your house. Um, so community nurse, how can you help overcome barriers with good communication? In my opinion, you sincerity and show that you're not non-judgmental that you're out there sincerely to help. And it takes time because they don't know you and you don't know them. And, and so at first, what I do is like, um, and I don't want to spend too much of you guys' time, but I would go in with as little, little stuff on me as possible. I would have my cell phone and that sort of thing. I may have a little pad in my pocket, but I don't come in all loaded up with all my stuff and looking like I'm CPS or something like that. I just go in, try to look casual, let folks talk interject here and there um you gotta build trust i can i can i can tell like that mom right there i don't know how many visits it took for her to be able to wash her child uh give her child a bath but she cannot hide the fact that she is like she is beaming um so again um establish and assess your environment, safety, safety, safety. Before you even go out there, you wanna review, why are you being sent out there? What's the, for? oh, hey, Melissa, baby, hey, sweetie. Um, why are you out there? What's the purpose of your visit? Just like when you're going in to do an assessment, before you, your community is your assessment. Just have as much information as possible so you're prepared. I know we keep saying that over and over again. 
So one of the things they harped on are the age related concerns, okay? Safety for our children. Said sudden infant death syndrome, okay? It's um, unfortunately, it's still a public health concern. So you're educating new moms back to sleep, nothing in that crib. And you don't have to like memorize all this. They're not gonna say it. I don't think they're gonna say uh, it's just a blanket in the bed. What do you do? I don't know, I haven't seen it. But as far as in infants, you wanna, you wanna know that SIDS is a concern, public health concern. Remember we're doing public health. And abuse is reportable. You're a mandated reporter. If you suspect abuse, you do your due diligence. You're legally obligated to report it, period. If you see it, you have to report it. All right, you will get in trouble. Children know what environmental things you should look for um, when assessing common areas and playgrounds. And again, safety, 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 safety. That's what it's all about. Because again, what we talked about in my class today is that you know, preventable stuff like are they wearing helmets and the seat belts? And then, then you know, most folks think when they get out of the, a certain car seat, you know, there's boosters, there's different things. And um, adolescents, car accidents, um, car safety is the number one issue for those guys as well. And then, um, yeah, yeah. And then just keep in mind that just because they're infants and children and adolescents, they can have like adult issues, not adult, I shouldn't say adult issues. There's children with asthma, there's children with diabetes, there's children with different elements, just like you know adults um, as well. So risk assessment. Um, one of the things they harped on about as first children, they really talked about gun safety. I think I'll start there. So um, the whole part, the whole, the importance of risk assessment is that you're, you want to evaluate um, for potential concerns, um, exposures to this, that, or the other, from cigarette smoking, environmental stuff, to guns in the home, to, to anything that can negatively impact someone's life. So when you're doing a risk assessment, you're um, evaluating for potential concerns. Just know that definition. So for young children, they, again, they mentioned, uh, they like to talk about gun safety. If there's, you know, this is not a pro or not against guns. I don't even wanna go there. If you know there's a gun in the home, you talk to the parents about safety, storage, that sort of thing. And you have to be so delicate with some people and their guns but it's not the fact that they have a gun. It's the fact that there's children in the home or vulnerable folks and you don't just have it on the coffee table, right? You should never, stuff like that. All right, no mixing of substances with possessions and, and anyway, um, that's with you gaining trust and what have you. Uh, okay, so gun safety, just know that. And then, School nursing, we did a whole thing earlier today about school nurses. We watched a little video. These, these women and men, they have my entire heart. Their population is that school. And what we mentioned earlier was back in the day, it was uh, way back when, infectious stuff. But these nurses, nurses are dealing with chronic conditions, asthma, fe feeding tubes, we mentioned all that. They're coordinating with doctors and dentists. Um, they're treating emergencies. You know, I think I have this, head lice, prevention. No, um, I have my notes from earlier today. Primary prevention in the schools, the primary is health education, promotion. Think of educating kids on the safety of um, wearing a helmet or something of that nature or fruits and vegetables or the food guide pyramid or what have you. But it's nothing exists, there's no disease. So just, if you know your definitions of primary, secondary, tertiary, you can't get tripped up. So primary anything is you're doing something to prevent something from occurring. Nothing exists, no disease is there. So if you saw that somewhere and they mentioned primary prevention, 
you know that that has to do with um, per, uh, health promotion and education, vaccination, prevention of injuries and illnesses, substance abuse, all of those kind of education teaching you can do to the schools, to the kids. And then, um, let's see, secondary screenings, head lice, um, screenings is a, is a big one. What else? I don't know if they do like um, vision, hearing, that sort of thing. Um, and then tertiary, again, I had a lovely video I showed where you know, nurses were doing feeding tubes and insulin and checking sugars and that sort of thing, breathing treatments, nebulizers, that sort of stuff. They're case managing as well, but I think case managers talked about in another chapter. I don't want to give you too much. Treat emergencies, all right? Kids that come in, you know, I'm vomiting, my stomach hurts. Injury prevention, diminish environmental risk to kids, obesity, think nicotine, smoking, um, what have you. In nursing, you're going to encounter ethical issues. It's just, you, it's not avoidable. It's not a bad thing. You just want to know where you stand with certain things as far as, um, I don't know, um, how you feel about abortion, how you feel about this, any other, so that if you come across an issue that cha challenges you, um, challenges your beliefs or your this, that, and the other, um, you need to understand this before starting the profession because even I have um, come across issues, but you still have to take care of the patient. And this, the country we live in, people have choices and that is fine, it is their life. So coming in, you need to know yourself, okay? And you need to deal with these moral dilemmas. There's no society that tells you how to deal with it. It's what you don't want to do is not deal with it and get yourself in trouble by not providing care. Um, maybe that's not the job for you. I'm not going to get into all that. And so the Nurse Practice Act is on this slide. So you want to be aware of what that is. Every 50 state and territories have nurse, every state has a nurse practice act. I know my nurse practice act, I don't have it memorized, but as a nurse practitioner, I know what I can and cannot do. Opposed if I went back home to Florida or Georgia as a nurse practitioner. So you need to know this. Even if you're like, oh, there's so much to do. No, no, know what you can do as an LPN and know what you cannot do as an RN. Any LPNs here? Let me see if I can see. I can. Any LPM? No? Yeah. I can't hear back. Oh, Judy, okay, meet you back in the day. Yeah, <laughs> there's things you can do as an LPN that um, that you can't do, things you can do as an RN that you're not gonna be, that you weren't able to do as an LPN. You know there's certain things we could push and do. And we all we can start IV. I, I did can. back in the day. Really? In the state of Florida. We had to take an IV course. Now, this was in 1994 or five, but I worked as an LPN on a um, busy pulmonary floor, respiratory floor. And so we had to be IV certified, which means that we were not trained as an RN. You're not. But we had to be to take this week-long certification course at this hospital, and then we were allowed. But then there were certain things we could and could not push by law. I know that sounds complicated, but... If your IV certified as an LPN, if your state allows it, you can. If your state doesn't, then you just can't. No. It is what it is. But my mm. state allowed. Oopsie. Okay. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Oh, oh, oh. Hang on. Okay. So know your ethics and um, know, know yourself. And know, I've had conscientious objectives and pharmacists who don't give out plan B. and they have another pharmacist cover. Now, I'm not gonna get into was that right or not. The patient got their meds, that's all that matters. But we already knew that person was a conscientious objector, objector, which means he got, let's say Amber was a pharmacist to prescribe that. The patient still got their meds. So that's what ethical stuff means. If you come across something that's against your religious beliefs, giving blood or what have you, and you're a nurse on that floor, 
but let's say you're, I'm not, I'm just saying I'm not talking about Jehovah or whatever, but somebody needs to give it, whether Courtney needs to hang that bag of blood or Leslie, somebody needs to give it. That patient needs to not get their blood if the doctor orders. Y'all feel me now? That's what ethics comes into play. That that means you will lose your job, potentially, because that patient needed the blood. Whether you religiously wanted to give it to them or not, that is between you and your God, but that patient needs to get the blood that was ordered. That's all I'm saying. And that concludes our presentation. Public Health Matters, thank you in all of these different languages that are missing here. I will stop thank you so much. screen. Um, I am going to officially end it.